The next piece of the puzzle here is just exactly how the genetic code works. How, why does one particular codon code for another particular amino acid? So here's the genetic code. This is also code, called a coding dictionary here. So if I gave you a series of um, DNA, you could go along and find what codons are at what positions. We've got 61 different codons based on our um, uh, four different base pairs there, but only 20 amino acids. So there is a lot of duplication into, there's a bunch of um, codons that all code for the same amino acid. Over here on the right, we can see that there is kind of a method to this madness here, like alanine, here it says GCX, that, that X means that any base could come uh, after the G and C, and it would code for the alanine. So let's find that G, C, here they are over here. Like, there are all four options that would code for an alanine. We can get a little more specific with if we say something is a, like uh, here's asparagine, okay, we've got A, A, anything that starts with A, A, and then Y has either of the pyrimidines at the end. So let me find that there. So it's A, A, there's the um, A, A with the pyrimidine, which would be the uracil and the cytosine there, okay. And then let's grab another example where something is, could be either purine. All right, so, oh, here we go, AA-R, lysine, okay, so either of the uh, purines, either um, A or G would fit, and then we get a lysine. Okay. So there's this interesting repeat of, of amino acids here, um, except for a couple because AUG is the only methionine codon, and it also happens to be the star codon there, uh, and then we have this interesting Degeneracy, so there's more than one way to code for an amino acid. So here for isoleucine, there's three options, but one of them uh, right here, the one that's the, sw the switch from the start codon, the little wobble um, at the end uh, between the purines, that is the least used isoleucine codon. And over here by our one of our stop codons, UGA, we've got um, tryptophan uh, is the UGG, which is the third um, position wobble from uh, UGA, the stop. So it's the only trip codon, but tryptophan is the least used amino acid. So there may have been like an evolutionary push to not use things that could easily mutate into stop or start codons. There's another interesting thing is that related amino acids have related codons, okay? So we've got four main types of amino acids that I want you to know about. We've got polar and charged amino acids. So we've got lysine, arginine, and histidine that are positively charged and they're polar. We've got aspartic acid and glutamic acid that are negatively charged and polar. We've got um, ones that are polar but not charged. So serine, threonine, asparagine, glutamine, and tyrosine. Okay. And then we have the nonpolar, the hydrophobic amino acids that don't have um, a charge and they're nonpolar. So alanine, valine, leucine, isoleucine, methionine, phenylalanine, and tryptophan. Then we got three special cases, <laughs> cysteine, glycine, and proline, which are hanging out and doing their own thing there. So if we look at a codon chart and we color those in based on their groupings, you can see that the hydrophobic slash nonpolar there, any, you know, anything with a second position uracil uh, is hydrophobic or nonpolar, okay? There's these other groupings as well. So it was advantageous um, if you wobbled, if you messed up, if there was a substitution, it was, it's good in a sense, if you change to something that is clearly at least minimally related to you, there's less likely to be a massive change in protein function, therefore phenotype. Uh, if there's a little bit of a wobble or swap between these. So we can see this when we look at, say, a highly conserved protein like beta globin, which carries um, iron in, in some mammals here. If we look at the uh, sequences of the proteins, and so these are the single letter to denote a single amino acid residue, uh, we can see the red letters are the same in all of the species. We've got bat, aardvark, human, rabbit, whale, and mouse. Okay, We've got some, very rarely there's just one letter that's different in one of these. So like, uh, let's take a look at, so here's mouse in this particular position right here. We've got leucine, 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 valine, one different. 
Okay, but there definitely seem to be regions that are extraordinarily conserved. Okay, in all the animals, I meaning this is probably a really critical spot in the protein for for usage. But what's interesting is it's not not all of these are equally likely uh, changes. So this like here this GGGE. Okay, that might happen, but there's you're never going to see like a valine or something in there instead. So we can compare how different sequences are and also look at how related are the amino acids within those sequences. And this is where we get what we call a substitution matrix. Okay, we're not going to do the big box on this, but I do want to take a look at this one. This is the original one by um, Margaret Dayhoff, who built this substitution matrix, looked at a whole different bunch of, of um, proteins, and then saw where substitutions in these proteins happened between different organisms. How often was each amino acid conserved, and what was the most likely replacement? Okay. So most of the time, wherever you saw, if you look, here's your reference sequence over here of your, you know, um, most ancient uh, protein there. And then you'd look and see what happened. How often was an alanine, kept an alanine pretty darn often, but there were some things that changed, uh, it changed to more frequently and some things it would never change to at all. And then if you look at how related the proteins are, I think you're more likely going to find um, a related protein like a leucine here um, is going to swap more likely to a similarly typed uh, amino acid like isoleucine over here or methionine than it is going to swap to an entirely different type of amino acid residue. Well, serine's weird. Um, it's got two completely different uh, starting codes there. It's either UC anything or AG pyrimidine. And they both happen about equal parts of the time. So we're not sure. It's one of those cool mysteries that we're still looking into. So the big takeaway from this is that the genetic code is universal, okay, aside from some protozoa mitochondria, but those seem to be derived variations from something way back when. So the implications of this are that all existing life forms can be traced back to a common origin. Woo! Luca. All species are a finite number of genetic changes away from every other species. Enjoy that. Just let that sit on. Sit on that and maybe stare at a ceiling fan and eat some scour skittles or something. Thus, if a DNA sequence from one species is transcribed in another species, if we make some mRNA, okay, then it will be translated into the same amino acid sequence. You can blame this right here, the universal genetic code for every freaking cold you get because guess what viruses can put random mRNA into you and your ribosomes will go right ahead and produce viral protein so uh, blame the universal genetic code. Okay. Next up post translational regulation. What happens after we make our amino acid chain? That's it right? We're done? No of course not there's more so <clears throat> turn off my little marker. There are uh, five main types of post-translational modifications. Okay. In this particular figure, the top is giving you the name of the modification, and then the bottom half is showing you which amino acids uh, tend to have that modification applied to them. Okay. So starting off, we've got uh, methyl groups, methylation, and acetyl groups, acetylation, and those happen occur onto the positively charged amino acids lysine and arginine. Next, we have phosphorylation, okay, which is a, um, done by kinases. Basically, any like da 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 kinase is a um, you know, hopefully you know organic chemistry or like duh, but they attach the phosphoryl groups to these particular amino acid residues. There's a bajillion different kinases. They're cool. Okay. We have two different types of glycolization. Glycolization means you are adding a carbohydrate. You're sticking putting some carbs on. And so you can either have those linked to an N group, an arginine and asparagine, or you can link them to an O group and serine, threonine, and tyrosine. Either way, glycosylation. Um, so this is like the ABO blood groups. ABO blood groups are, are, are determined by which uh, glycosylated side chains you have on your receptor proteins on the outside of your blood cells. Okay, so this has to happen there in order for you to get your, um, these are the alleles that determine which uh, side chains you get. And finally, ubiquitylation is 
tag for destruction. This is any amino acid can have this stuck on it, and then that particular chain is going to get looked for by ubiquitin and chomp back down into amino acids. Another thing that can happen post-translationally is this proteolytic cleavage. Okay, so you can have cuts made uh, in your protein, your polymer sequence after it's been translated. Insulin is a really good example. There are two separate cleavage events after synthesis. So this is analogous to cutting out introns, kind of. Okay, so we have our product of translation here. We have our one long one long insulin chain together. We've got a couple of uh, sulfur groups matching up there, which is kind of cool. Our N terminus, our C terminus, and then we have these this couple different pieces that are referred to as the B chain, the A chain, and the C chain. And then as we go along, there's one cut here that takes off the signal sequence chunk. Okay, so this is now our new N terminus. I can draw an N, totally can. And then these um, the cysteines become cross-linked in between, sort of binding these together. We call this pro-insulin. And then the next step, the uh, C-peptide itself is cleaved, and you have a fully functional insulin molecule there, which is the two pieces uh, linked together with the uh, two double two links there. Okay. That's just one of many uh, proteins that are post-translationally processed by proteolytic cleavage. HIV does this too. Okay, uh, when some of the proteins are expressed in a HIV infected cell, they will make this long um, polymer um, polypeptide polymer chain. And the first thing that'll happen is the protease, this particular thing, folds itself up and cuts itself free. Okay, and that creates that makes its own protease, and then it cuts at a site between the integrase and the polymerase, the reverse transcriptase here. And then that makes the other viral proteins. This all happens post-translationally in this big protein. So that's kind of cool, thing, cutting itself to make more terrible things to go on and infect more cells. Okay? It's one of the reasons it's so insidious and hard to, for cells to fight. Okay, So we have our polypeptide, right, which is a long chain of amino acids. It's not really a protein until it folds itself up and becomes the shape it needs to be to do its job. So just to remind you guys, gen bio, goodness, we've still got the primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structures. So go review. Primary is the amino acid chain. Uh, secondary is the um, initial folds between the chain. Tertiary is larger structures. And quaternary is when we actually have different pieces of, of um, polypeptides coming together to form a protein here. So this is the um, uh, beta globulin, so showing the heme groups here. Two or more polypeptides together making a protein is called a multimeric protein. So we say that we have the sub subgroups, the submers, and then we have a multimeric protein. So there's this M-E-R for, for that designation there. Yep, hemoglobin. So finally, just to sort of sum up the past two chapters, this gene expression and regulation, which we will get into a little more in chapter 14, but just to kind of get the basics down. Uh, in bacteria, it's a pretty simple system. We have whether or not transcription turns on, and then if it does, well, ribosomes are right there, and we'll start translating that immediately. So the regulation in bacteria most pretty much occurs at transcriptional initiation. That's how bacteria do. Compared to eukaryotes, where we've got many different steps of regulation. When you become multicellular, you just become way more complicated and crazy, and therefore you need more particular stuff. Okay, so there's uh, the preonation of when, whether, oh, let me get a darker color, whether or not your chromatin is actually available to be modified, right? Whether or not your histones are all wrapped up. Okay, then your transcription factors bind. Do we actually get uh, the promoter to latch on uh, the RNAs? polymerase, RNA polymerase to latch onto the promoter. Yay, if it does, then it continues down. If there's no other things blocking it, we get the transcription regulation. Then we need our cap added, our polytail added. We need splicing. There might be microRNAs that target it, but, but, but it might move out of the nuclear membrane, and then it could get translated. And then all this other cool stuff could happen during translational regulation and post-translational modification. Okay. So 
This also happens for things that are non-coding, because we do have a lot of interesting non-coding RNAs, but they still have to go through non-coding RNAs still have to go through chromatin modification, transcription factors binding, RNA polymerase there, and then they go off and do other things. So this is like our tRNA still goes through these processes, our microRNAs, our short interrupting RNAs, long non-coding RNAs, lots of things that we're not exactly sure what RNA is doing yet, but are in the process of discovering. See chapter 14.